So our theme then is our Westminster Confession of Faith. On the 1st of July, 1643, an assembly of some of the finest ministers and theologians that the British Isles has ever seen met at the behest of Parliament. As a result of the Solemn League and Covenant, its remit, its job, <coughs> had grown <coughs> uh, considerably. They were to seek, in the words of the Solemn League and Covenant, the nearest conjunction and uniformity in religion, confession of faith, form of church government, directory for worship, and catechizing. And for nearly six years, the Westminster Assembly met uh, fairly constantly and labored uh, among their various endeavors, and they produced the Westminster Confession of Faith, the larger and shorter catechisms, the Directory for Church Government, and the Directory for the Public Worship of God. They also uh, produced the groundwork for what became known as the Scottish Psalter. The Scottish Psalter, uh, every line of it, passed through the Westminster Assembly before being sent to Scotland where it was scrutinized for several years by ministers of the uh, Church of Scotland of that time. Now the Westminster Confession and Catechisms are still subscribed to by all ordained officers in officers of the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Ireland. That means that every minister and every elder of the Reformed Presbyterian Church must believe everything in the Westminster Confession of Faith without reservation. Now, the Westminster Confession of Faith is a, a main part of the creed of the Reformed Presbyterian Church. We're not alone in that. Uh, other churches also hold to the Westminster Confession of Faith. So it is a major part of our creed. Now, a creed is simply a statement of what we believe. The Latin word credo means I believe. And so a creed is a statement of belief. Now, let us consider why we should have creeds and then why the Reformed Presbyterian Church should continue to have this creed, the Westminster Confession of Faith. First of all, Every Christian has a creed. Every Christian has a creed. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13, the Apostle says, We have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. The Apostle there quotes from Psalm 116 verse 10, and he says, what was true of David is true of us. We can speak because we believe. We have something that we believe. Christians believe something. Christians believe certain propositions about God, about the Lord Jesus Christ, about sin, about heaven, about hell. But you say, being a Christian is more than knowing about some, about these things. It's personal. It's knowing Christ personally. Yes, it is true that being a Christian is more than knowing about certain things. Uh, in James 2 verse 19, we're told, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. There are things that are true, that the devil knows are true, but he remains a devil. He knows there is one God. He hates that God, but he knows unavoidably that it is true. So you say, yes, so being a Christian is more than believing certain propositions to be true. And of course that's right. It is more than that, but it is not less than that. You see, if you believe nothing, if you believe nothing, you're not a Christian. If, to give one basic example, 
if you believe nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're not a Christian. Christians believe certain things about the Lord Jesus Christ. Or if you believe what is seriously wrong about the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're not a Christian. You see, in first letter of John, first John chapter 2 and verse uh, 22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is, an, an, he is antichrist that denieth the Father and uh, the Son. There the apostle is saying, if someone denies this truth, then he is a liar. He's not a Christian, he's an antichrist. He professes and perhaps preaches and trusts in a Christ who is not the Christ of Scripture. An antichrist is one who opposes Christ by uh, substituting an alternative for Christ. That's why uh, the, the Antichrist spoken of in Scripture we regard as the Pope of Rome because he claims to be the Vicar of Christ, the one in the place of Christ. But as well as the Antichrist, there are other Antichrists who, uh, would, who set before men a false Christ, who believe in a false Christ, who do not accept what the Scriptures say about the Lord Jesus Christ. So in chapter 4 of 1 John, verse 2, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now is it in, uh, in the world. And then in chapter 5 of 1 John and verse 10, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not, God ha hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. The record God gave of his Son. There are certain things that must be believed. So what exactly do you believe about the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you think it matters if the Lord Jesus Christ is God or not? Do you think it matters whether the Lord Jesus Christ, though God and without ceasing to be God, became a man, really a man, or not? Do these things matter to you? You see, a real Christian, he can distinguish between the biblical Christ and that which is not Christ. He have an unction from the Holy One, and he know all things. So, is this Christ you trust in? Is he distinguishable from the non-existent Christs of the Jehovah's Witnesses, so-called, and the Mormons, and the Moonies, and so on? Is your idea of Christ a biblically governed idea of Christ? If I ask you uh, afterwards, what can you tell me about what the Bible teaches about the Lord Jesus Christ. What could you say? Can you tell me anything about what the Bible says about the Lord Jesus Christ? Because it matters what we believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. Today I was reading in the newspaper there was a review of the National Gallery's exhibition called Seeing Salvation and it was uh, and a, a selection of artistic representations of Christ and on the front page of the newspaper the contents uh, part of the top it said how we view Jesus Christ well frankly how, uh, how, uh, however great these artists may be what they think about Christ isn't worth anything it's what the scriptures say about the Lord Jesus Christ and Christians, real Christians want to know the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ from the Word of God. Now when we turn to the Westminster Confession of Faith, we find the biblical teaching gathered together. There's a chapter called uh, Christ the Mediator. The second paragraph of it reads as follows. The Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, being very and eternal God, of one substance and equal with the Father, did, when the fullness of time was come, take upon him man's nature, with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin, 
being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary of her substance, so that two whole perfect and distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably joined together in one person without conversion, composition or confusion, which person is very God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. That's the teaching of the Word of God. It gives the verses of Scripture that most explicitly bear upon these things underneath. So every Christian has a creed. If you do not believe anything, then if that's possible, about uh, uh, I don't know, uh, but if you believe nothing, you're not a Christian. If you don't care about the Lord Jesus Christ, about what the Bible teaches about him, then you're not a Christian. Because every Christian has a creed. Secondly, all churches have creeds. All churches have creeds. The slogan, no creed but Christ, is nonsense. There are those who say, we don't want a creed, we don't want doctrinal statements, formulations, no creed but Christ. But that is nonsense. First of all, because it is a creed. A man who says, no creed but Christ, that is his creed. It declares what he believes about creeds. It also declares the belief that Christ can be known without believing anything in particular about him, which is both untrue and absurd. There is no such thing as creedless Christianity, and there is no such thing as a creedless church. Every church has a creed, a has something that it believes, whether it's right or wrong, good or bad, biblical or heretical, every church has a creed. Whether it's written down, or whether it's in the mind of the leaders, or whether it's never been articulated by them, but it's there in their minds, every Christian body and every religious body has a creed. You go to a church that claims to have no creed, and you say something that they don't agree with, and you'll find that they do have a creed after all. They haven't written it down, they've never formally adopted it, perhaps they've never even decided what is in it or not. But it's there in the minds of those uh, responsible uh, for that particular body. There are certain things that if stated, they would say, no, that's wrong, because they do have a creed. They say they don't, but they do. Every church has a creed, and every church should have a biblical creed. Every church should have a biblical creed. We read in 2 Timothy 1.13, Hold fast the form of sound words. The church is to be the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 That means the church of God in this world is to be like the pillars holding up the truth before men. And every biblical doctrine should be held up front. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and the first three verses. 2 Corinthians 4 Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. The apostle is saying, that there was no secret agenda, no hidden agenda as far as his ministry was concerned. He declared the truth. There were no schemes, no, no frills, no camouflage. He simply preached the truth of God. There were no hidden doctrines kept in reserve until people were among the initiated. And what is true of the Apostles' ministry should apply to the testimony of the Church. 
What we believe on the basis of the word of God should be above board and up front. We should be ashamed of nothing in the word of God. A church that will not openly state its doctrinal position but keeps some of its doctrines in reserve for the initiated is a cult. A church that won't tell you what it believes is a cult. The idea is you get people in, then when they're rather committed and it's hard to pull back, then you unveil the package of hidden doctrines. That's a cult. Have nothing to do with any religious body that has inner secret doctrines uh, because true churches of Christ have nothing to hide. And we want the whole world to hear what we believe the Word of God teaches, holding forth the Word of life. Our confession of faith is acceptable and uh, is accessible to all. If anybody wants to know what the Reformed Presbyterian Church stands for, here it is. And we want anyone and everyone to know the truth that we hold dear on the basis of the Word of God. And we want other Christians to know. We want them to know where we stand doctrinally, to have fellowship in the truth that we share and to discuss if they want to, the point on which we differ. You see, fellowship is in the truth. People say doctrine divides. Truth unites. There can be no fellowship without truth. There can be nice, pleasant evenings of friendship, but there can be no Christian fellowship without truth. So the idea of putting doctrine to one side Though it may have the appearance of fostering Christian fellowship, it actually is the death knell of real fellowship in Christ. You see, if doctrine doesn't matter, then the Reformed, the Reformed Presbyterian Church certainly shouldn't exist. If doctrine doesn't matter, the Reformed Presbyterian Church has no right to exist. The existence of denominations presupposes the importance of holding and following in practice what we believe to be the teaching of the Word of God. If doctrine doesn't matter, then the Protestant Reformation was unnecessary and unjustified. It was a great mistake, and of course there are people saying that, aren't they? But if doctrine doesn't matter, then Luther's insistence that the scriptures teach justification by faith alone, in Christ alone, was all much ado about nothing. It was just a, a big storm in a teacup. So all churches have a creed, and all true churches have a biblical creed. But then thirdly, thirdly, the madness of starting from scratch. The madness of starting from scratch. Particularly when new churches are formed, there is often expressed a view that runs something like this. We're starting a new church. We regard the Bible alone as infallible, which is true. We have the Holy Spirit, so we'll start again and we'll write our own doctrinal statement. We forget about all that has gone before and we'll start with a blank sheet of paper and write down what we believe for ourselves. Is this a good thing? It certainly has the appearance of placing a high view, of a high value on scripture and the present work of the Holy Spirit. But it treats the work of the Holy Spirit in the past as worthless. But you say, well, no, we're not saying that God hasn't directed his servants in the past at all and led them into a measure of biblical truth. But can't God lead his people into the truth 
now, just as surely as he did then, by his Spirit enabling them to understand the Word, and can't we produce something just as good? We have the Bible, if we're Christians, we have the Holy Spirit, can't God direct us and cause us to produce a statement of doctrine as good as anything that has gone before? Indeed, he could. But you have not the slightest reason to think that he will. Of course he could. But you have no reason for thinking that he will. The doctrinal statements and creeds and confessions of the Reformation and the Puritan Age came from the hands of teachers that God gave to the Church at a high point in the Church's history. For us to try and reinvent the wheel and act as if the Kingdom of God only began when we were converted or when our Church was set up is simply pride. That's all it is, pride. It looks like, it looks like great spirituality. We'll start with just the Bible, we'll ignore everything that's gone before. It looks very spiritual, but it's just pride, that's all. Even a modified historic confession is better than a brand new one. Though we believe for our part that the Westminster Confession needs no modification. Better still if we can stick to the Reformation and Puritan confessions of faith. A recognizable basis for churches to express unity. You see, if every church, every single congregation produces its own statement of what it believes, then each church becomes individualistic, whereas if we look to the confessions of faith of the past that are known, then they can be, uh, that can foster and help uni uh, fellowship and unity among true churches of Christ. The clean break or blank sheet approach is a disaster and it's due to the pride of rampant individualism. Don't break with the past. If what comes down to us is according to the word of God, stick with it. Sometimes people try, say, well, we're against denominations and so we don't want to have a creed from the past because it fosters denominationalism. We're going to start a church that is interdenominational, non-denominational. What happens when people try to start a church that is non-denominational? It becomes a denomination. That's all. There is no such thing as a non-denominational church. We should be ready to be taught by the godly men of the past. We should listen to them. Let me give you an example of something from the Westminster Confession. In the chapter on repentance unto life, in the uh, chapter 15, paragraph 4. As there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation, so there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. What a masterpiece! What a magnificent statement of truth. For clarity and scripturalness, you'll not beat that. No sin so small, but it deserves damnation. Scriptures teach that, don't they? <coughs> that the wages of sin is death. However small our sins may be in our eyes, they're not in God's. Every sin deserves damnation. But there's no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who, tru those who truly repent. That Christ can save great sinners, all kinds of sinners, who come to him, he will not cast out. Marvelous. Fourthly, fourthly, what Reformed Presbyterians believe. What Reformed Presbyterians believe. 
We believe the Westminster Confession of Faith in its entirety. To summarize the content of the Westminster Confession, we can do so under the thought that the Westminster Confession, following the Scriptures, consistently acknowledges God to be God. The Westminster Confession, closely following Scripture, constantly insists that God is God over against the lie of Satan, which he uttered to Adam and Eve in the garden, ye shall be as gods. You see, the essence of sin is the desire for man to take the place of God, to be as God, to be independent of God, uh, to not need God, to not have to rely on God. This desire to be independent of God, this pride which shows itself in the desire for independence of God, is of the essence of sin. Independence of the Word of God, independence of the authority of God, independence of the power of God. All sin involves this desire to be independent of God. And so one striking feature of the Westminster Confession, because it follows the Scriptures, is its exalted view of God. The Westminster Confession, because it follows the Scriptures, acknowledges that God really is God. And the Westminster Confession, in line with Scripture, encourages us to think highly and exaltedly of God, and to think lowly of ourselves. Let me ask you, can we think too highly of God? We can't, can we? Can we ever think too highly of God? Of course we can't. God is infinitely exalted above all flesh. And so the Westminster Confession seeks to direct us biblically to think highly of God. And we can summarize its content under three headings. I'll give you the three. Firstly, God's sovereign power over all and man's utter dependence on God in all things. Secondly, God's absolute authority and man's duty to submit to God in all things. Thirdly, God's glory as the chief end of all things and man's subservience to that chief end. This view of God pervades the Westminster Confession. Let's just uh, look at some of these things more closely. First of all, God's sovereign power and man's utter dependence on God in all things. In the Westminster Confession, uh, and following the Scriptures, God is seen as sovereign and almighty and man as utterly dependent upon God in everything. First of all, God's sovereignty, sovereign power in revelation. The very first paragraph of the Confession of Faith talks about the light of nature, and then he goes on, it goes on to say, It pleased the Lord in sundry times and in divers manners to reveal himself. This is the starting point of the Confession of Faith. It defines the source of all its doctrines, the Bible. And why do we have a Bible? Because God, who owes us nothing, was pleased to reveal himself. God didn't have to give us a Bible. He didn't have to speak to us. He could have damned us without a Bible. Christianity does not begin and did not begin with men seeking after God. It began with God speaking to men. And so the confession says, The authority of the Holy Scripture dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God. Then the confession goes on to speak of God and the Holy Trinity, where what God says about himself in Scripture is set out. Then we have God's sovereign power in creation. Chapter 4, paragraph 1. It pleased God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, 
for the manifestation of his eternal power, wisdom and goodness in the beginning to create or make of nothing the, the world and all things therein, whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days, and all very good. Notice that phrase, it pleased God. The confession uses that phrase several times. It pleased God. God didn't have to do it. It pleased God. Then the confession talks of God's sovereign power in providence. Chapter 5, paragraph 1. God, the creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence. The Westminster Assembly didn't believe in chance, do you? They didn't believe anything happened by chance. Chance is a word used by ungodly men who don't want to acknowledge that God is behind everything. They want to forget God. They don't want God in all their thoughts. And so those things that they cannot explain why it happened, when it happened, and so on, they say it happened by chance. Chance is meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. Christians don't believe in chance. They believe what the Bible says, that God worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. We're not to believe in a helpless God waiting to see what supposedly independent man does as if God is helpless and, 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 and doesn't know what to do and he's waiting on man. God is in control. This God, the God of the Scriptures, he really is God. And then the Westminster Confession speaks of God's sovereign power in salvation. What is true of all things is certainly true of salvation. God is in control. Why is there a way of salvation? The confession tells us, chapter 7, paragraph 3, man by his fall, having made himself incapable of life by that covenant, that's the covenant of works, the Lord was pleased to make a second, commonly called the covenant of grace, wherein he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. Why is there a gospel? Why is there a gospel, a message of salvation? Well, because God was pleased that it should be so. Why is there a free offer of the gospel? Because God was pleased that it should be so. Why is there a Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ? The Confession tells us, chapter 8, paragraph 1, It pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten Son, to be the mediator between God and man. The reason there is a Gospel, the reason there is a Saviour, the reason there's a Bible, the reason there's a world, is because God pleased that it should be so. But then why do some believe unto salvation when others don't? Why is it when the word of God is preached, some believe it, some don't, some are converted, some are not? Why is that? Well, the answer is given in the Confession of Faith. Chapter 10, paragraph 1. All those whom God hath predestinated unto life and those only he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit. It's God who makes the difference. It's not because those who believe have some natural superiority so they can say, I believe because I'm better than the person next to me who didn't believe. Not at all. It's the sovereign, eternal election and predestination of God that causes some sinners to believe while others do not. By nature we love darkness rather than light. We're dead in trespasses and in sins. And though we hear the gospel all our days, by nature we love, we, we cling to the darkness, we despise the truth, our hearts are at enmity with God. As the scripture says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto, the, unto him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. And unless God changes our hearts, 
We do not believe the truth. The Lord Jesus said to the Jews, Ye will not come unto me that ye might have life. It is the God of heaven who from all eternity has chosen the heirs of salvation, who effectually works in the hearts of his elect, so that they, while others despise the truth, they believe they are made willing in a day of his power, and they heartily, gladly embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as he is freely offered in the gospel. Why did even some angels fall? while others kept their first estate. Why? Why did Satan and the demons, why did they sin while others kept holy and pure? Westminster Confession, chapter 3, paragraph 3. By the decree of God, for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestinated unto everlasting life and others foreordained to everlasting death. God is God. The Bible teaches it. The Westminster Confession sums it up. God is God. Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. But then also the Westminster Confession teaches us, in line with the word of God, God's absolute authority and man's duty to submit to God in all things. This sovereign God who controls all still has the right to tell us what to do. We're dependent upon him for the enabling to do it, but yet he still commands men what to do. He tells individuals what he requires of them. The law of God is summed up in chapter 19 of the Confession of Faith. God defines right and wrong. You know, when atheists and humanists and unbelievers talk about right and wrong, they've no right to talk in that way. Right and wrong presupposes universal standards. And there can only be universal standards if there is an unchangeable and universal lawgiver, and that is God. And the Westminster Confession owns God's right to tell us what is right and what is wrong. On the subject of liberty of conscience, it says, God alone is Lord of the conscience and has left it free from the doctrines of com and commandments of men. So it owns God's right to tell us what is right and wrong, and denies that man has the right to impose what God has not. When it comes to the worship of God, how do we decide how to worship God? Well, the Westminster Confession, 21, paragraph 1, says, The acceptable way of worshipping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshipped according to the imaginations and devices of men. The Reformed Presbyterian Church has a very simple form of worship. It's the form set out in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Why do we stick to that? Well, you see, we stick to it. I'm sure uh, Professor Mackay dealt with this yesterday, but we stick to it because we believe God is to be worshipped God's way. It's not just a question of tradition. Oh, you do it your way, we do it ours, and what suits you is fine for you, and what suits me is fine for me. Not at all. The way to worship God is not your way, or my way, or anybody else's way, but God's way. And only God's way. You see, we have to acknowledge God to be God before we begin to worship. We don't say, well, we like doing this, and we like doing that, and we'll we like doing the other thing and we'll bring it all together and we'll call it the worship of God and then we'll acknowledge that God is God. We've got to acknowledge that God is God before we start and say if God is God, then God must tell us how to worship Him. He knows what is acceptable to Him. When it comes to the state, the Westminster Confession teaches that all human authority is God-given or usurped. So, chapter 23, 1. God, the supreme Lord and King of all the world, hath ordained civil magistrates 
to be under him over the people for his own glory and the public good. And then it goes on to limit the, the civil ruler's power that he may not assume to himself the administration of the word and sacraments. So the Westminster Confession in line with scripture teaches that all legitimate authority is God-given, that the church and state are distinct, though they have responsibilities to each other, they are distinct under Christ the King, and the state is to do what Christ in the Word says it must do, and the church is to do under Christ the head what is appointed to the church. And so when it comes to the church, chapter 25, paragraph 6, there is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ, nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be the head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalteth himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. So when we think of the church, it is Christ who, in the word who appoints how it shall be governed, by whom it shall be governed, and what shall take place in its worship, and what its functions are. You see, the church isn't like the model railway club, or the tennis club, or the golf club, or the music appreciation society, where people come together in a common interest, and they say, well, we'll make the rules up for ourselves. The church is the church of Christ, under Christ the King, and its functions, its government, its worship, is appointed by Christ. Christ told the apostles, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching all nations, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So when it comes to the sacraments, do we invent them? Or do we deduce them from scripture? So the confession 27, 4, there, are, there be only two sacraments ordained by Christ our Lord in the gospel. And it goes on to show that they are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Church discipline. Uh, chapter 30, paragraph 1. The Lord Jesus, as king and head of his church, hath therein appointed a government in the hand of church officers, distinct from the civil magistrate. So the state doesn't govern the church. And it then gives uh, some censure, some disciplinary measures that belong to the officers of the church. Admonition, suspension from the sacrament of the Lord's Supper for a season, and by excommunication from the church. So what's all this about? Well, what's about is this. It's Christ's church. He defines the boundaries. So when the session meets to decide whether someone should or should not be admitted to the Lord's table, it doesn't have a, it can't do its own thing without sinning against Christ. It is Christ who defines who the sacraments are for. He defines who shall be treated as members of the church. If someone behaves in such an ungodly manner that the scriptures require that he be no longer treated as a Christian and as a member of the church, then the session, the elders of the church, are duty bound under Christ to act in accordance with the word of God and to exclude that person from the membership of the church. You see, it isn't a social club. It doesn't hang together by tradition. Christ is the king. He's the king of the church. He defines who should be included and who not included in the membership of his church on earth. He is the king. But then, thirdly, under this point, God's glory as the chief end of all things and man's subservience to that end. When we look at what's going on in the world, we say, where will it all lead? Where will it all end? What, what are things going to come to? The apparently random events of history. Is it all leading anywhere? Well, yes, it is. It's leading to the everlasting display of the glory of the attributes of God. The lot of the confession of faith says, God hath appointed a day wherein he will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ. All that is but the unfolding of the eternal plan of God, and it will lead up to that day. And that day will bring about the eternal world of heaven and hell, and the manifestation of the glory of God forever, both in the glorification of the redeemed, 
and in the everlasting damnation of the lost. So in the Confession of Faith, chapter 33, paragraph 2, the end of God's appointing this day is for the manifestation of the glory of his mercy in the eternal salvation of the elect shall be cast into eternal torments and be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. This is the day the people of God longed for. This is the day they longed for because they desire to see the Lord Jesus Christ vindicated when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. The redeemed do so gladly and heartily, but even his enemies, though filled with horror, will know that he is the Lord, and they will be utterly frustrated forever, because they cannot deny that he is the Lord, though they heartily and eternally wish it were otherwise. So the people of God long for the vindication of the honor of Christ. And that's why the confession of faith ends by saying that they must be ever prepared to say, Come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Can you say that? Do you long for Christ to be vindicated, to be, to, that his honor should be upheld, that blasphemy should stop forevermore? And it is this biblical view of God as controlling all things, as having absolute rights over all things, and whose glory shall be displayed at the eternal end of all things, that we must believe today. Well then, our confession of faith teaches us that God is the blessed and only potentate, the King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. If you're an office bearer, a minister or an elder or a deacon in the Reformed Presbyterian Church, if you took your vows of ordination seriously and conscientiously, then you believe all of these things on the basis of the Word of God as set forth in the Confession of Faith. But just a question. You see, can we really ask Christian men to subscribe totally and without reserve to a man-made confession of faith? The answer is yes, we can. But you see, the Bible alone is infallible. How then can we say to men, if you want to be an elder in this church, you must agree with everything in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Because believing in an infallible Bible does not mean that we cannot say that we believe this statement on the basis of our understanding of the scriptures is entirely true. Nor does it mean that we cannot say to, to a man, if you want to be an elder in this particular church, you too must believe that all of this is true according to the word of God. You see, but isn't that making the confession of faith infallible? No, it's not. It's simply saying on the basis of the infallible word, this is what we believe, and if you want to be an office bearer in this particular church, this is what you must believe also. Doctrines are expressed in words. But you say, isn't it enough that we say we believe the Bible is the word of God? Well, no, it isn't. The so-called Jehovah's Witnesses, if you ask them, they say, yes, we believe the Bible is the word of God. The Mormons, they all say we believe the Bible is the word of God, but they don't believe what we believe the Bible says and teaches. And so it's not enough to say, well, you have to believe the substance of the Westminster Confession. It has to be believed in all that it teaches. You see, the idea of saying, oh, you have to believe the substance, who defines the substance? You're really subscribing to nothing. There must be a belief 
of all that is in the Westminster Confession. The doctrine and practice in the Westminster Confession provide the basis <coughs> for, uh, of agreed doctrine that has to exist and of agreed views on church government that needs to exist in order for the church to be governed, ordered, and to maintain and proclaim the full counsel of God in unison. But then, one last thing. We live in a dark day, spiritually. The church is in a mess. Our nation is in a dreadful state. I think none of us realise just how dreadful the cause of truth seems so weak. And you say, this is all very well, but shouldn't we tone down our stance? When the church is so weak, when society is so wicked, shouldn't we scale down our doctrine? And the answer is no, a thousand times no. When things are dark, what is needed is light. When the nation is full of blasphemy and falsehood and wickedness, what needs to be held up before men is truth. We should not be ashamed of anything in this document. Not one phrase if we're convinced it's the teaching of the word of God. When things are dark, you don't turn the dimmer switch on the lights that are left. The country needs light. What is needed, and I speak as a Reformed Presbyterian, but what is needed, certainly for the Reformed Presbyterian Church, is not to bring our doctrinal standards down. It's that we should rise up to meet them. So what I say to you all, and I say this in kindness, read the Westminster Confession. Whether you're a Reformed Presbyterian or not, I appeal to you to read it read it. Don't let it be something that you hear mentioned at ordinations and installations when the minister or the elders say, uh, answer the questions, do you own the doctrine of the Westminster Confession of Faith, the catechisms larger and shorter to be founded on and agreeable to the word of God and it, you, you recognize these form, this form of words. Read it. Study it. Study the scripture proofs given in it. Search the scriptures to see whether these things are so. So that in due time you will be able to say, I believe the Bible is the word of God and I believe this confession of faith sets out clearly and distinctly what the Bible teaches. And if need be, I can get my Bible out and show that this is so. Because that is what our church, the Reformed Presbyterian Church, needs. And I believe that any one of us studying this document and the scriptures that lie behind it will profit in our souls as we increase in understanding of the Word of God reaping the benefits of the labors of godly men who were mighty in the scriptures from former ages and being established in this doctrine hold it fast hold it forth because these doctrines constitute none other than the glorious gospel of the blessed God Amen Let us